This video contains a ton of restored Bloodborne content, unused Dark Souls cinematics, a revelation I had about Elden Ring, and an incredible secret about the Maiden in Black, Sveet. I'm serious, actually. And look to the description for my first official Dark Souls merch collaboration. This is the Great One Beast, a cut boss discovered all the way back in 2017, but at the time, it had all of its visual effects missing. Luckily, Foxy Hooligans noticed that these FX IDs matched those of the Orphan of Koz, and they used those effects to restore this boss to its full glory, replete with a lightning dive. Giant bolt attack, sweeping wave strikes, and a relentless lightning storm. I'm kind of surprised they didn't finish up this boss and add it to the game, but one thing I'm glad that From Software left out are these unused physical attacks for the Winter Lantern. On the other hand, here are some attacks I do wish were in the game. The Mikalash marionette was once capable of throwing its hands, its feet, its head, and even its everything at the player. There's even a spin attack. Again, these were all restored thanks to Foxy Hooligans, including more moves for the Garden of Eyes, who was once able to cast a variety of spells. It casts these with a small spider-engraved stone talisman, something that it still holds in the actual game. Lastly, the Loran Cleric enemy was at one point supposed to be a boss with a much wider range of attacks. This fight would have been so well paced, except for, well, the frame rate at times. And perhaps had this been an actual boss, it could have been included in Bloodborne's Boss Rush Dungeons. Funnily enough, these were close enough to completion that the official Bloodborne strategy guide actually mentions them as if they do exist in-game, though of course they never made it in. As far as we can tell, these boss rushes would have only featured a small sequence of bosses, probably a themed set of bosses, located in these unique arenas. Now it's impossible to tell if the boss rushes were meant to be rooms at the end of a layer, or if they were meant to be their own separate chalice dungeons. I wish this made it into the game. Sekiro's Game of the Year update has shown that boss rushes really do suit the Souls formula, and I hope they continue to add these to their games, even if they're just post-launch updates like with Sekiro. Also added to Sekiro in its Game of the Year update were remnants, manually recordable phantoms that can be shared between worlds. Uh, they can show hidden rooms, they can show effective techniques, they can even show you glitches that allow you to skip certain bosses. But one thing I've not seen anyone mention about these is that remnants are marked by a small kunai, a small throwing knife of the exact same sort used by Lady Butterfly, who is a boss that's well versed in, you guessed it, summoning phantoms. Furthermore, these phantom kunai have the Father's Bell Charm attached to them, linking them, of course, to Father Owl, whose forest is also filled with mist and mystifications perfect for training in the illusory arts. Another thing I'm not sure I've seen people mention is this really stunning overlap between the Sunken Valley Riflemen and the bandaged lepers featured in Hayao Miyazaki's Princess Mononoke. So, both sets of characters are incredibly talented marksmen, equipped with long flintlock rifles that they hold and treasure at all times. Both groups exist within a wooden gun fort, and not only that, but both gun forts defend a mining town. The Sunken Valley clan are also bandaged, likely because they live in a valley full of toxic minerals, and the lepers are bandaged too, because they're suffering from, well, leprosy. Lastly, many of the valued snipers in Iron Town are women and women have a special place in the Sunken Valley Clan as well, since two of them are the Snake Eyes mini-bosses, who are descended from the legendary Okami. That's so much overlap, it's ridiculous. Both Princess Mononoke and Sekiro also feature the idea of impurity that's really rooted in Japanese culture. Both even feature these resilient main characters with tainted yet powerful arms. Sekiro's prosthetic arm carries and is strengthened by spirit emblems, which are these manifestations of regret or bad karma, and Ashitaka's arm enlarges when he's in need of great strength, a side effect of the defilement that he touched at the beginning of the movie. Go and watch that movie if you haven't, it's one of my favorites. Moving over to Dark Souls, at one point there was a cutscene that had a giant crow take you away from the painted world, instead of you plunging down from the plank. 
Obviously very fitting, since crows are such a big part of the painting, but it's unclear whether the crow would take you out of the painting or just to a different part of it. Speaking of cut animations, yeah. Desert Sorceresses once had a very interesting grab attack, but they actually had to cut it because players kept getting hit on purpose. Most of the dragons we fight in the Soul series are, more accurately, wyverns, as they walk on two hind legs. This is supposed to signify that they're a more common, modern breed, and quadrupedal dragons in the series are usually ancient dragons instead, like the Gaping Dragon, Sin, and Medea. However, there is one more everlasting dragon that we haven't been able to get a good look at until now. Zully has discovered this, the ancient guardian dragon. And you've probably seen it before. It's actually the enormous dragon that you spy dead on a mountain in Archdragon Peak. Once it was likely envisioned as a boss as well, a role that was almost certainly moved over to the ancient wyvern instead. Its model resembles a handful of statues in Archdragon Peak, as well as this incredible piece of concept art, which sort of has white hair swept backwards like the Nameless Kings. There is one dog in Dark Souls 3 that is not like the others. It's even hidden out of sight, in a small cave to the left of the final bridge along the Path of Sacrifice. If you look closely, you'll realize it's maggot infested, and it's incredibly bloated. And if you look even closer. This pup has been on my secret list for years now, but I was reminded of it because of Limit Breakers, a channel which has an entire video on the space-time distortion abilities of dogs in Dark Souls 3. I'm sure you've all noticed that these dogs teleport while they're chasing you, right? Well, it turns out that it's only the larger arrow-pierced dogs that do so, and they only do so off-screen, which means it has something to do with them entering your render area before they're ready to do so. So throw the old man a bone and watch his video if you want specifics. But even more cursed than the Dark Souls 3 dogs is Gale, a slave knight who has successfully staved off undeath longer than any other character in game. The undead curse and curses in general have a visual identity that's associated with skulls and I wanted to point out that this might be why Gale's boss design is literally overflowing with them. I like this, because a part of the Dark Sigil's description is, the darkness of humanity seeps from this bottomless pitch black hole, the gap filled by the accumulation of the curse. The curse has been accumulating within Gale for a long time, and it shows. In Dark Souls 3, your humanity isn't that valued, especially when you consider Yuria's Lord of Hollows questline, which features a gameplay mechanic where embracing your hollowing can actually make you stronger as it can grant you free soul levels. On the flip side, in the original Dark Souls, humanity is definitely a highly valued resource. When offered up to a bonfire, the black sprites act as a surrogate for the curse. It draws the curse out of your body and releases the strain that it puts upon our own humanity. Thus, a hollowing is reversed. Fittingly, the original Dark Souls apparently used to have a humanity exchange mechanic as well. But unlike in Dark Souls 3, where you would give up your humanity to gain levels, you could actually give up levels to gain humanity in Dark Souls 1. This mechanic was cut, but I love how it reflects that humanity is more valued in Dark Souls 1. And I just love how internally consistent this is from a lore and a gameplay perspective across all three Souls games. Speaking of spanning all three Souls games, here's my newest merch project. It's called Trilogy, with the art designed in collaboration with Zan Valenkak, put to print by Fangamer, and officially licensed with Bandai Namco. So the signature helmets of the Dark Souls cover characters are split into thirds, with a sort of molten Estus linking them together, and a dark eclipse in the backdrop. The classic shirt is on a grey heather, and the limited edition one is on indigo, marked with some choice graffiti. And this one's only available for two weeks, starting now, and then never again. So Fangamer have some of the best shirt printing in the industry, and I don't think you'll be disappointed if you grab one. If you do support this, thank you. It might actually help me commission more officially licensed designs with Bandai Namco in the future, which would be really fun. Hopefully, one day soon, Namco will show more of Elden Ring their upcoming title, and even though we've talked about the trailer to death, believe it or not, there are still some details I haven't mentioned. So alongside the announcement trailer, this image was shared. To me, it really gives off huge Dark Souls vibes, doesn't it? The coiled sword reminds me of a bonfire, and the character reminds me a lot of Prince Lothric. That said though, there is one much darker detail here. 
the robe this character is wearing might well be human skin. Most obvious is the face on the cowl, but even this part of the robe looks suspiciously like a hand. And if this is skin, then this marking here might have been a tattoo? Interesting. But I feel like the biggest revelation I've had relates to something that you could easily overlook. The logo and the title itself. It's easy to assume that Elden Ring might be a physical thing. It's been shattered after all and there's a guy hammering away at something in the trailer. Of course, something this superficial is unlikely to be the case and Miyazaki has pretty much confirmed this. He claims that Elden Ring is the name given to a mysterious concept that defines the world itself. He says it functions as the rules and rhythm of the world and that it's been shattered. What we're seeing in the trailer is likely a series of characters that are coming to terms with this paradigm shift. Now consider the logo. Four rings, six if you count the two hints of a circle at the top and the bottom, and four of these rings overlap in the middle. And that's what I think is the key word, overlap. If these rings represent the rules and rhythm of the world, and they're overlapping, this might be a huge clue about the rules of the world, because it reminds me of Berserk. Berserk is a series that From Software have been really liberally inspired by in the past, I'm sure a lot of you know that, and its lore features a concept of three overlapping realms. It's a macrocosmic trinity that consists of the mortal realm, the astral realm, and the ideal. Many fans depict these realms as a series of overlapping rings, and what does that remind you of? So, in the mortal realm, uh, our bodies exist. It's a physical world where humanity resides for the most part. And I say for the most part because the mortal realm does have some fringe connection to the next world, the astral realm, also known as the afterlife or the netherworld. Here, ethereal beings reside in yet another set of overlapping layers. The shallowest layer is called the interstice, which bears similar scenery to the physical world as they're quite close, and it houses these lower tier astral beings like trolls or the regretful dead, and magically inclined humans even have one foot in this realm and one foot in the physical realm sometimes. Deeper layers contain increasingly powerful and supernatural beings that can influence the world on these increasingly macrocosmic levels, eventually culminating in the ideal world, a place that holds the intentionalities of all life forms. It's this swirling abyss of souls where the ego itself cannot survive. So there's all of these layers, but in Berserk, a magnanimous event called the Great Roar of the Astral World eventually occurs, which merges the physical and the astral world into one global interstice. Chaos ensues, the dangers of the astral realm are unleashed upon the physical realm, the rules and rhythm of the world are broken, and I bet that the shattering of the Elden Ring is going to be almost identical to this event. But it's just a theory at the end of the day. It could be nothing, or it could be everything. Honestly, there could be an entire video here. I'm just kind of waiting for Elden Ring to confirm this on some level before I consider diving even deeper into this theory of overlapping cosmic realms. It's actually really one of the most interesting parts of Berserk for me. Another thing I'd like to bring to light is a discovery by King Duran on Reddit, who pointed out this really fascinating detail in the Demon Souls intro cinematic. In the still scene that depicts this war between the first scourge against the demons, we now notice that these hulking figures actually bear some sort of resemblance to a lot of the cut content enemies. Uh, the stomach mouth of this yeti creature can be seen here, for example. The face of this creature looks like that of the hyena enemy, and this smaller giant wields a club like this cut enemy. So these enemies were cut from a level that was originally supposed to be accessible via the sixth archstone in the Nexus. This archstone was once given to the great giants of the northern lands, but it's blackened in game, which implies that its world tendency has become pure black and it's been completely lost to demons. So Realizing that the enemies that were cut from the land of the giants might have been actual giants, fighting in the first scourge that could have overwhelmed this archstone is just so fitting. It feels like it can't be coincidence, right? But let's end this video with a truly incredible observation. No jokes, this is serious lore, so pay attention. Do you know why the Maiden in Black is barefoot in the Nexus? Why her feet are so filthy in the remake? 
Well, according to her official profile on a now removed official website, it's because she's blind and she uses her feet to feel her way around the Nexus, allowing her to fulfill her duty as a firekeeper and keep all the candles lit, despite not being able to see. There's a reason for everything in these games, don't you know? Thank you for watching. These videos are a combination of facts that are largely discovered by the entire community, so in a big way I am just helping to bring these to a wider audience, so please make sure you check out the talented folks in the description for more facts like this. A lot of them post some amazing stuff, so yeah. Also consider checking out the Trilogy merch if you're interested, and I'll see you next time.